going on part number five, actually, uh, of a study we've been doing about government. However, we're only going to briefly touch on that, move into another area, and then come back to it uh, by, um, uh, by next, uh, next week. Also, uh, this evening, we're going to have to have just a, a brief business meeting with, uh, with regard to the new church. Um, uh, it won't uh, be uh, very, very long, but some things have got to be decided, and um, we're just going to have to uh, keep on doing this. Those that are there are going to decide. Those that are, uh, uh, don't show up, then um, uh, I'm sorry, but if we're going to make a deadline by being in the building at June 1st, this is the way we've got to do it, uh, and uh, we, we do um, uh, feel bad for those um, uh, who perhaps want to be a part but are not. Uh, so that will be uh, this evening, uh, and uh, we've got some important things to decide. Uh, and uh, we're back in the process of, of uh, deciding what kind of building we're going to have, uh, how much steeple we want on it, if any steeple at all, um, those, uh, those type of things, because all of those things cost, and it, ju it just depends. Um, you know, what we what we want, but we have to have those answers if we're ever going to get a bottom line figure. All right, let's just uh, uh, whet our appetite for future study by looking at some pictures, um, pictures that will um, um, perhaps stir some emotions, especially uh, for those who lived uh, uh, in the World War II era. Um, let me ask you a question with regard to, uh, to this guy. Did uh, Hitler pose a threat to the United States of America? Sure he did. If he hadn't uh, been checked where he was, he would have taken over the world. I mean, there's, just, there's no doubt about it. Uh, he, was, um, uh, he was that kind of guy. He had uh, that, that, um, that kind of power. Uh, it's just that um, Jesus Christ controls history and things changed at, at that moment. Uh, the question, during the World War II era, should believers have wanted to, to see him dead or saved? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, well, that's, uh, uh, that's a good one for... Uh, how about this guy? Would you rather see him dead or saved? Okay. Uh, in thinking of this, uh, do you think he ever will be saved? No. Uh, he's, he's too far gone. Uh, and that's important to understand about leaders. Leaders even in the United States of America. Um, we're not always guaranteed good leaders here in this country. And as a matter of fact, if you've got majority rules uh, in a country, you're going to have people voting their emotions, their subjectivity, their bellies, and all that sort of thing. And uh, because of the majority rule concept of voting, where anybody can enter in the franchise, you can get bad leaders, potential bad leaders in the um, uh, United States of America. Okay? Now, I mean, maybe, maybe next year. We might have the first woman president. It's a possibility. Or four years after that. Um, I'm not going to ask this question because it's on the tape. Uh, we're not going to give any names because I don't want any uh, repercussions. But what about um, salvation or difficulties perhaps with this person's health? <laughs> okay, same thing. But... Um, uh, we're to pray for those in authority over us, and we need to pray for salvation. By the way, all of those, if they, uh, two of them are alive today. Uh, we've got, we've got uh, uh, Hitler. Uh, if, if Hitler was alive today, should we be praying for their what? Well, we should be praying for their salvation. Next, uh, and if not the salvation, that they would begin to make decisions that would allow us freedom. And these are things we're not going to answer them today. We're going to go on a whole new track. And I'm sorry for going this direction that I'm going to veer off to something that, uh, that's uh, uh, related in self-governance. And that's what we want to talk about today. We talk about good leaders and bad leaders, and, but the fact of the matter is, if you are, don't govern yourself in according with, with God's principles and understand how to get back in fellowship and those sorts of, sorts of things, 
you, as well as all of these others, can be a detriment to the United States of America. And before we get off into the other area, I'm going to show you exactly how. Does this guy have a potential of causing detriment to the United States of America? Yes, he does. The reason is, this, this person right here got liberal politics in the liberal wing of the United Methodist Church. This guy gets his conservative world peace um, type uh, uh, deal from the conservative wing of the United Methodist Church. This person believes that government can bring in salvation to the world. This person brings, uh, believes that government, being a good person, um, uh, ridding the world of terrorism, uh, can bring salvation to the world, a, a world of universal peace. And uh, though uh, there's no doubt as to which of the two <laughs> and the last two that we, we prefer and are proud of and are grateful to God that this particular person is the right, in the right place at the right time, Still, when you're talking about when you're talking about politics, you also go back to a person's uh, theology. Uh, Hitler back here. Oops. Uh, his his political ideology uh, um, was governed on a rejection of the fact that the Jews are to be God's chosen people. Uh, he wanted the Germans to be in there, and what he was trying to do was make the Roman Empire holy again. <laughs> and to take over for himself. He was driven by his, uh, uh, his uh, ideologies and the fact that he rejected religion. Here's a guy who's driven by his religion. His politics are shaped by what he believes about God and his particular holy book uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, if he were in the United States of America and you wanted to be in this church studying the word of God, you know what you'd have to do to him? You'd have to fight him. You'd have to lock and load. You'd have to, you'd have to draw a line in the sand and say this is all the farther you're going uh, you're to get. It may be that that happens here. Uh, there will be legislation if people get in that will simply say, well, now, you can't say a person needs Christ as Savior uh, because that makes them a sinner, and that's, that's uh, hate-mongering. Uh, uh, and uh, any type of, of that sort of thing is going to be um, legislated away. Uh, in favor of um, every, I'm okay, you're okay. Uh, don't, don't ask, don't tell type deal. Okay? But we still have that same potential here. Uh, as, um, as we're here in the United States of America and terrorists uh, um, are, um, are threatening us, the clamps on our freedoms are going to become greater and greater and greater because the terrorists are not going to let go and it's going to take a, a matched response, a greater response uh, from our government um, to, um, to salvage um, our freedoms. Okay, now that brings us to our political gauge. Uh, again, we're not going to get into, into any depth and, and detail, but oftentimes uh, uh, folks are a little bit surprised at our stance here with regard to where, where are you in relation to, to politics. Well, I actually belong to the Biblicist party. It is a non-existent party except in the mind of God for the dispensation of grace. Uh, and uh, that's, that means that there is no ruler and no political party except those who are believers in Jesus Christ apart from the works of the law. And by the way, if the United Methodist Church believes in works for salvation. Now, you can be saved and then become a member of, of that church uh, later on, but the only way you're saved today is by grace through faith without works, and even though they may have a religion, that's it. The United Methodist Church is, is a, a is driving force in pluralism and diversity. Watch their commercials. Open hearts, open doors, and open minds. And there are people say, well, I'm surprised that there's a church like this. I don't believe like they do, but they still welcome me. Well, <laughs> what is the truth? Would you please tell me? Uh, this can't be right if this is so, uh, and, and uh, uh, so forth. But along the lines here, we've got those who um, come over to the fascist side. The fascist side where one individual has the world uh, um, swirling around him. 
But then again, uh, that, that is not good. Yes, that's true, that all of us are individually going to answer uh, uh, for ourselves before the Lord. But in that same portion, Paul says, no man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. We are not separated from a society. And of course, then that, that's, uh, that's where communism, though, takes it to the other extreme. It is society to the exclusion of the individual. Surely God has struck a balance when he talks about our individual answers and our societal answers. Same thing with, um, with capitalism. We believe in capitalism and that sort of thing. But a capitalism that, that builds itself on the backs of workers by not caring for them, by not uh, providing safety for them, by not paying them their fair share, violates that the laborer is worthy of his hire. And love works no ill to his neighbor. But then on the other hand, a socialism uh, that attacks uh, business to the extent uh, where um, where they hurt and they threaten and they kill families and they bomb cars and that sort of thing also violates thou shalt not murder uh, uh, the uh, uh, appeal by Paul not to threaten workers uh, uh, or or, um, or uh, the um, uh, uh, business your bosses in order to get something from them. On the one hand we believe in conservative values uh, but, uh, but a conservatism that has no compassion violates the principles of the Lord Jesus Christ where he said, I'd rather have mercy than sacrifice. Go learn what that means. He said, if your ox falls into the ditch on the Sabbath day, what is, what is more merciful? To let it, to let it sit there uh, 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 stuck, hungry, and, and, and needing water, needing care, uh, uh, subject to the elements? Or do you on the Sabbath day show mercy on that day, even though it's the law? The, the conservative thing, that, that's it, and we're not going to budge from it, even though it's the law. Isn't it not more merciful to, on that Sabbath day, get that ox out of the ditch and, and restore it to a proper place? And that's true. But then on the other hand, you have the liberalism, which says that uh, here, here are people who don't want to work. They could work, uh, but um, uh, they just want to sit home and watch the soaps while the rest of us work and have to add to the coffers double. We have to work double and triple and quadruple in order to keep them up in life, you know, paying for everything because they just don't want to get up off, uh, off their lazy backside. Both are wrong. There's got to be a balance. It's the same thing with, with the parties. There's got to be a happy medium where you as a believer in Jesus Christ can sanction the political candidate. Now, uh, that's our political gauge, and that's biblicism, where we, we look at both sides and, and come to a, a, shall we call it, a, a, a happy uh, a medium uh, and, and in a, in a biblicist type deal, simply because there are Bible truths on both sides that govern and shape our own politics. Uh, and this is something that we'll uh, uh, get, get back to. Now, I made a statement about a man giving a speech uh, back in the 60s, that when he gave that speech, America died. And this is one of the reasons where you have the cultural swirl. The problem with America today is also its, its, uh, its greatest characteristic. And that is that we have freedom and accept everybody. The problem is when you accept everybody, there are some real big adjustments you have to make if you're going to have unity. And uh, you'll note that that man touted diversity and plurality. And that man is associated with the church that I mentioned with. Uh, their, their, um, their coalitions and the, that uh, sort of thing uh, are all associated with that particular church. That church is steeped in politics in the United States of America. It is going to join real soon, you watch, uh, the, the, um, the, the Vatican in this ecumenical, uh, neo-evangelical push that's being made today. Uh, your, your, um, your, your promise keepers um, uh, and all that, that sort of thing. All of those things are associated with those churches that believe in diversity and plurality. Now, there is legitimacy to some diversity and plurality. 
thank God for Chinese food, and I'm not Chinese. <laughs> Mexican food, hey, what are we talking about? Diversity, plurality. Uh, uh, Italian food. Life wouldn't be the the same without spaghetti, and you know, and and that uh, all, all of those things. It just it just wouldn't be. That's diversity, and uh, we're all living here together, and we we uh, accept one another's uh, diversity. We appreciate the plurality. We can enjoy uh, various things, but there's also some dangers coming in here when people want. Diversity and plurality by com uh, and to bring in unity by compromise. You know, when people have their cultures, they also have their other gods. Now, we can recognize one another's food and one another's values and one another's backgrounds, but <laughs> I am not going to recognize another person's God. I'm not going to do it. Well, then you're not going to have unity. Yep, you got it. When the Dalai Lama, a man who believes he is a reincarnation of God and should be worshipped, comes into this country, into this state, dedicates a building for world peace, recognizing all religions, uh, I'd like to boot him in the behind and just see how much of a God he is, you know. Uh, kick him in the shins and see how he reacts. Does he bleed like any other man? Is he on the inside so, so divine that he'll not get a little bit upset? Um, but that's what's happening. Uh, today, we have thought, you know, it, it costs lots of money to go there, there to that thing. I mean, they had, they had personalities. Muhammad Ali went to that, that dedication. And that's what, what it is. It is, re, it is trying to bring about unity in, so we don't, we don't argue with diversity and plurality about one another's religion and one another's God. And my Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And my Bible says, don't be unequally yoked together with, with unbelievers. And the Dalai Lama could pay me a million bucks, but I would never share the platform with him ever to say, we believe that, that all gods are, are equal. It's whatever gods you make up in your mind and worship and, uh, and the I'm okay, you're okay. It'll never happen here because I'm not all that interested in that kind of unity. So America's greatest characteristic is also her greatest weakness because we can never have as grace believers unity in the realm of religion. We can do it in other areas, but never in the realm of um, religion. So if you would now turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And we've seen the cultural swirl, the heterogeneous culture that we have this plurality and diversity is swirled into a homogenous culture. Um, we're all one and nobody better say anything bad about the other. And of, and of course, you can't do that as a believer. You've got to take your stand and say, this is not God, uh, this is not right, this is not the proper practice uh, or belief and, and so forth. But now we, we came up with some some difficult things because of what we teach here and believe here about prayer. Uh, we've had political leaders, uh, uh, things happen to political leaders and they get, uh, get sick and, and so forth. And immediately we want to say pray. And once again, we say, okay, but what are we going to pray for? That political leader, though it's a political leader, is still a human being, dead in trespasses and sins, a Christ rejecter, preaching another gospel, which Paul says, okay, that's a cursed gospel. What do you pray for? Do you pray for that they get better? Or do you pray that they get saved? Now, let me tell you, praying for political leaders is commanded in the scriptures, but what you pray for is also specified in the scriptures. And just because a political leader gets sick, 
The prayer should be, Lord, use this, use this to send them light to get saved. Because just like the political leaders that we showed you uh, at, at first, unless they trust Jesus Christ as Savior, where are they going for all eternity? Are you, you, you scared to say? <laughs> I'm not afraid to say it. Unless they have trusted Christ as personal Savior, according to the no works clause in Paul's gospel, there's none of them going to be in heaven. None of them. As fine as they are in other human characteristics, the best of men are men at their best and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that human solutions are no solutions. Only God's solutions solve what really is wrong with man. Now, I bring that up to show you that you and I, as well as every other human being, can cause two potential swirls in history. God controls history around people, depending, and that, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. He controls history around you and me and others. Verse number 28 in Romans 8. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, if that statement is true, you're a God lover. All things may not be good. You may not have the, <laughs> the right person represented on the throne or in the office of your particular country. And, and by the way, America is not the only country in the world. Uh, um, boy, just, just think, if you wanted to get saved and you lived in Saudi Arabia, man, a lie. Uh, yeah, you'd, uh, you'd get saved and meet your maker at one of the same time, probably. But is that good or bad for a God lover? People have been martyred before. All things work together for good. And as people have been burned at the stake, others have gotten saved because of their testimony. Um, as people who have resisted governors who, who won rulers who have said, don't worship the true and living God, and they've been imprisoned, and they've been beheaded, and they've been persecuted, and they've been driven from the land, and so forth. At the same time, with the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Others get saved. Plus, every time somebody witnesses to one of these rulers, uh, good or bad, on the, on the spectrum of things, um, to whom much is given, light is sent, to whom much is given, uh, much is required. In other words, the more they see of your testimony, even though they're going to martyr you, the more they see of your testimony, the more, the more obligation they have and the more judgment they're going to receive uh, at, the, at the white throne uh, because of this. However, you can go the other route here and be a God hater. History is going to swirl around you for a time being. The, the, it's, 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 no, uh, um, it's obvious that since the fall of man, Satan has usurped the, uh, the scepter of a rulership and ownership of this planet. And unless Jesus Christ comes back. So, uh, uh, but the world is rich. The world is famous. Everybody know, can name names and see these people and uh, Hollywood stars and, and uh, popular politicians and this and the other. But they're God haters. And for the time being, things seem to be working for them. Things uh, seem to, to, to work out. It, it, is it not uh, um, uh, obvious when the Lord Jesus Christ was offered the kingdoms of the world, he said, no, I'm not going to bow down and worship you. But is it, it doesn't it become obvious then that somebody named Antichrist is going to bow and get the kingdoms of the world given to him. At that time, history is going to swirl around him. All things are just so good. I'm in control. People are worshiping me. I get to give my mark on them and, and, and so forth. We're going to bring in utopia here. But do all things work together for, God, uh, for good for God-haters? No, it's going to be bad. 
When Antichrist is cast alive into the lake of fire, do you suppose that all that's going to be really meaningful to him? <laughs> the swirl of history, boy, it looks like he is going to win. It's going, he's going to be on top. And all of a sudden, Jesus Christ comes back and he sets up his throne and, and he gets the goat nations of which Antichrist and the false pro prophet physically alive are going to be the leaders. They're cast alive into the lake of fire. Did it work out for them? It did not. It will never work out for them. Jesus Christ controls history around these two factors. History swirls. And that is why I've said about this. We can accept the diversity and plurality of some, but never of others. But it's going to cause us problems in the days ahead. Uh, one way or the other, it's going to cause us problems. And we're going to have to take a stand. But is that stand going to be... Hurtful and painful? Probably so. But all things work out for what? Good to them that love God. This is the way walk ye in it. Our own Savior was crucified, and he gave a good profession before Pontius Pilate. Uh, he, he told him what for. But yet he also said, the one who turned me over to you is more culpable and responsible than you, Pilate. Even though you've got this and are responsible for yourself, there were others that had more light. Gave me to you, the high priest uh, and the people of Israel. That's what we're studying, the green tree, dry tree. The green tree, the evidence that Jesus was the Messiah was there, and they absolutely rejected it. But they rejected it with full light and knowledge of, of who he was. Okay. Now, let's begin a transition, if you will, by just calling to memory um, the three types of dispensational truth. We've studied these before. We're not going to spend much time on them. Uh, we'll come back sometime and go into even greater detail. But you'll recall our study of food and the three types of dispensational truths. Transdispensational truth, let's use food again. Food is good. It is a good illustrator of, of these things. Okay? Who provides all food, whether, whether good or bad? The, the sunshine and rain on the just and the unjust. Just and the unjust. It's God. Okay? And it says that God, Paul, uh, says that God provides these things as a witness. So throughout all dispensations, God provides food for men. But has God always provided the same kind of food for men throughout the dispensations? No, for example, in the first two dispensations, men were not allowed to eat meat. All right? Of course, in this dispensation over here, men were allowed to eat meat of both clean and unclean, but not allowed to eat blood. This dispensation over here, men were not allowed to eat blood, but they could only eat clean animals. In this dispensation here, dispensation of grace, men are allowed to eat blood and clean and unclean animals. Yeah, and yes, we just had an amen, hallelujah, glory to God, <laughs> for uh, an inch thick <laughs> medium rare steak. <laughs> Fine. But we identify these particular truths as interdispensational. That is, these two are, are different dispensations, but there is a similarity there with regard to food. And then with regard to eating anything, including blood, is an intradispensational truth. It's not been true in other dispensations uh, uh, with regard to the entirety of, of food. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind. But now... You also have to keep in mind that these things also govern salvation and sanctification, getting right with God and being right with God. If you are in a dispensation, and we've got the seven, innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, grace, and kingdom, God has different ways of dealing with men regarding how they get saved. Now, um, let's note three potential categories of salvation. We're in Romans, uh, turn to chapter 9. Here is a, here is a trans-dispensational truth. 
about salvation, all right? Point one, works per se minus faith never saves. It doesn't matter if a person is a humanly good person and in the power of the flesh produces much moral good in the, in the world. He's still not saved. Or if he lives under law and does everything God requires uh, under law in order, uh, in order to be saved. He meets at the temple, keeps the feast of Jehovah, provides appropriate sacrifices. But he just uh, he does it because, uh, you know, he's part of the nation. It's, it's what we do here uh, uh, and, and the like. You're still not saved. Romans chapter 9. And uh, look here at... Um, Verse number uh, 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness didn't attain to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were, by the mere works of the law. Works in any dispensation after the fall attempting to bring about uh, merit uh, for your salvation to God never saves, whether they're the works of the law or whether they're the works of the flesh. Neither can measure up to God's standard. However, let's turn back to the book of James. Book of James chapter 2. And in the book of James, we have stated for us um, that in order to get saved under the dispensation of law, you have to have faith plus works. Now, those works are the divinely prescribed works of the law. So there's a combination there. Now, that's, that's going to help us to understand where you have verses that don't seem to teach eternal security, and they don't. It's conditional security. And those areas like the writings of Paul, which teach eternal security, uh, uh, because one obviously says you've got to have faith in Christ plus keep the law. Well, Hebrews, James and the rest belong to that that portion of scripture. You, you tell me we've got the law and the what's the other big uh, umbrella category? The testimony, Matthew, Matthew through Acts, Hebrews through Revelation are not our works. We can go and study them and look at them and see transdispensational uh, 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 truths, but they're not our letters. How do we know? Well, James and Paul disagree here. Is Paul right or James right? Yes and no. <laughs> James is wrong under grace. Paul is wrong under law. And vice versa, and uh, would be right and vice versa. So it says here, uh, we're in the book of James, uh, where it talks about, verse 14, What does a prophet, my brother, and a man say he has faith and has not works? Can faith alone save him? Of course not. You're under law. And it talks about uh, uh, brother or sister, naked, destitute of daily food. And you say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. But you don't give those things. Uh, what does it profit? By the way, what key of the kingdom is mentioned right here by James, who was part of the, uh, the Jewish law? The seventh key of the kingdom of selling all, giving it to the poor, and you see a brother and sister here, but you don't help them. This is in the tribulation period where the mark of the beast is, is there. And you, that's, that's, it is priming it for that time. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. You have faith and I've got works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show thee my faith by my works. And then it, then it goes on here to quote um, uh, Abraham, where it says in verse 24, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Okay, now, what happened to Abraham, who Paul uses as, as a Gentile saved by grace, and James uses as a, as a Jew now obligated to keep the law? What happened to him? that made him obligated to the law for his salvation. Turn back to the book of Galatians. Book of Galatians. Got a few minutes, stay with me. Galatians 
where it says, verse number three, chapter five. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. That is, if you're going to go with God's, God's legal program for salvation, in order, the, the very first step in order to participate in the Passover, the very first step in order to, to be able to come into the presence of God at the tabernacle or temple, what does a person have to do, Jew or Gentile? Gospel of the circumcision. You've got to be circumcised. That's what the Abrahamic covenant is. This is the token. If a, if a man child is not circumcised, if the, if, the, if the stranger is not circumcised, he has broken my covenant and cut off from his people. He can't be saved. Salvation is vouchsafed in Israel under the law. So it says in verse number three, he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you're going to go with that program, you've got to be saved by faith plus the works of the law. Israel's original uh, problem was that they thought the works of the law alone would save them without faith. That's not, that's not true. The law has always had the aspect of faith plus the works of the law in order to be saved. All right, now let's go to, let's go to uh, one more, uh, by the way, with regard to this matter of cir circumcision and the use of Paul and James, when Paul used uh, Abraham, was he circumcised or uncircumcised? He was un an uncircumcised Gentile and saved by grace. When James uses the illustration of Abraham, what had happened to cause an obligation now to legalistic things, divinely prescribed legalism? What had happened to him? He was circumcised. Took 25, 25 years after he, he was called into the land. Uh, let, let's go here to chapter 2 while, while we're here uh, in Galatians. Now you can understand something. Uh, at least I can. Verse 7, chapter 2. Contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me, Abraham was uncircumcised, and so Paul can justly use him as an illustration of salvation by grace through faith apart from the works of the law. Abraham wasn't obligated. But it says, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. Peter was a, a Jew, and now he's following his father Abraham in doing just what Abraham did. He expressed faith. But then he was circumcised, which, which uh, uh, in effect was the token of his binding to works of the law. Now, uh, we're, we're a little over time, but I don't want to, to leave you without going to Ephesians 2. By the way, did Jesus Christ preach? When he was here on this earth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, faith minus works or faith without works for salvation. He did not. But when he came back to, to this earth with Paul, cut off Israel and the, and the covenant and circumcision program and the gospel of circumcision was no longer in effect. From that point on, Jesus Christ preached the grace message, which is, verse eight, for by grace he is saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, that eliminates even the divinely prescribed works of the law that, uh, uh, that we have in the Bible. We are saved this way, faith minus works. Not just the works of the flesh, but even those divinely prescribed. Why? Because today we have the gospel of, of uncircumcision and Paul stating in verse 2 of, of Galatians 5 that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision today uh, matters anything uh, as far as Christ is concerned. The covenant works program is over temporarily.